Okay. Uh, let's get started. It's one thirty. So we have a lot of content to cover today. So let's start on time. Uh, hopefully, everybody should have a uh, paper clip in your hand. Uh, if you don't have, we have another uh, three instructors at the door, so they can uh, give you one to you. So uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, scalable data science using R. So this is a, we have four uh, instructors today. Uh, Vania, uh, Robert, uh, Mario, uh, and me, my name is Hang. I'm a data scientist in uh, Microsoft. So here we have uh, we have already pushed all the uh, tutorial content uh, into and uh, including the slides to this uh, Git repository. So you don't have to do anything uh, in this end because every all the content contents have been uh, delivered to you via the uh, uh, the Data science virtual machine. Uh, the, inform the machine information is on the, also on the paper clip, and also some other content we uh, we also deliver through the Jupyter notebook. We're going to we're we going to use uh, later on. So no need to do anything now. Just uh, listen to me. Uh, heads up, and then uh, let's start it. So. So here is the. Uh, uh, outline of this tutorial. First, I will give you a very uh, brief introduction of R uh, for scalable data science, what kind of offering we have uh, so far. And then I will we'll go to the hands-on part. Uh, the first part will be the R in SQL Server, how we can do in-database analysis, advanced analysis using R. Then we'll go to the kind of more scalable way so because everybody, most of the data scientists uh, uh, encountered the big data problem. Uh, that's a very big headache for our users. I guess that's also part of the reason why I see so many, so many of you here. So we're going to uh, show you and also hands on uh, how to do the R in uh, Spark. Then fo following that, we are going to have a two kind of case study the, uh, one is the distributed model training and the parameter op optimization. Use, uh, uh, one is the learning curve, one is the group time series forecasting. Uh, the second uh, case study will be the sen sentiment analysis uh, using a pre-trained deep learning model in R. Okay, now let's uh, move to uh, what is R. So I guess I, I, let me make it brief. R is based on a lot of survey. R is the most popular statistical programming language, a data visualization tool. There's also a beauty of that is an open source uh, language. It has uh, over 2.5 million uh, users worldwide. Based on what I see here, I guess this number is definitely underestimated. And it is taught by uh, in most universities and the many common use cases ac across the industry and the thriving user groups worldwide, it is ranked as the fifth um, uh, most popular uh, language by IEEE in 2016 and 42% uh, for all uh, data scientists uh, prefer R uh, against other uh, data science languages. And it has a huge uh, ecosystem with over 10,000 packages and uh, rich application and platform. And you can find a lot of existing code on Stack Overflow that can be a very good uh, starting point for you to do uh, coding for any function. Uh, but obviously, there are challenges for R. The first challenge for R, uh, programming in R, is that it requires you to move the data from somewhere to your R workspace, right? If you incur some challenges, such as how about if your data is big? Moving the data from the data source to the R uh, workspace is, if, if it is possible, can be still very painful, right? Can, can take a long time. And also it, it in, introduces some kind of data security problem. For example, if your data is secure in a database, if you move it out, it is out of the 
security control of your database anymore. So probably your EDA will not be happy with that. And the second challenge is that how we can make it scale. R usually runs single thread and only a com uh, can hold the data that is, can be loaded into the memory. So think about you have 10 gigabytes memory, or let's say 30 gigabytes memory. That's a pretty uh, priceable uh, machine. So the rule, the rule of thumb is that you can only hold probably one third of the memory, available memory, right? You need, you need to have some kind of uh, uh, space in the memory to hold those kind of temporary files. So that means you, the maximum size you can, hold, you can handle is 10 gigabytes. But 10 gigabytes for now is small, very small. So it's not enough. Now the, another uh, challenge for data scientists uh, using R is that how do you operationalize? Because now, the, uh, tr traditionally, data scientists need to, after they build their model in R or whatever, they need to hand it over to a software engineer. And software engineer might have to rewrite the entire solution in some other languages, such as C Sharp or C++ or Java, right? But that translation, that means the data scientists have some dependency in order to really operationalize their model. They have to depend on the time half a year, something like that, before your model can be operationalized. How we can make this faster, how we can give more power to data scientists to enable them to, to have more uh, instant impact on the business directly, right? So that's, those are the things we want to uh, address uh, in, uh, in this talk. So that is the scalable uh, R solutions. Uh, currently, there are some, some of the existing R packages for scaling up uh, on single machines, such as the Big Memory Project and the FF and related packages, and for each and the dual parallel. I don't know how many of you have successful story in big memory. Uh, my, mem my experience with big, big memory is that it might allow you to load the data into a big data, kind of big data into the memory, but the follow up kind of processing is very difficult, right? And so then when people develop some packages to, for scaling up, uh, with distributed computing, especially on Spark or on uh, 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 Hadoop. So we have Spark R, Sparkly R, Rebel Scale R. That is the uh, previous name before Microsoft uh, acquires this uh, Rebel Revolution uh, R uh, company uh, in 2015. And of course, uh, to point it out, the Spark R and the Sparkly R and the Rebel Scale R, they also run on single machine. So but I, and for some reason, I just put it here. And also, we have some other offerings, such as H2O, R Sparkling, and for each with do Azure Parallel, do Snow, something like that. So here is the first. No, that's a brief introduction of, of R and why we need to scale up R and what kind of offerings we have uh, in the market, uh, uh, in open source, what kind of offerings we have to, to handle this kind of scalability issue. So here, the first technology we're going to introduce today is the uh, SQL Server R services. So this, this one is talking about okay, how you can uh, do in-database advanced analytics when the data is in SQL Server. So the value it brings by this kind of technology is that it reduces or eliminates the data movement with in-database analysis. That means now, as I said before, purposely, if your data is in SQL Server, you might have to move first move your data out of the SQL Server into somewhere into the R workspace, right? So it introduces the scalability issue, the data size issue, and the security issue. So now we are in SQL Server 2016 and plus. We are in, for this kind of technology, you are not moving data out of the SQL Server. Actually, instead, you are moving your script into the database and run it there and get your result out. Right? That's the uh, different technology, uh, different mechanism. 
And also, we, by this uh, kind of technology, we are allowing you to operationalize, as a data scientist, you directly operationalize your model as uh, in this uh, SQL Server store procedure. I'm going to show you later on how to do that. That means in your SQL, SQL query, you can add some R scripts there. In that R, R script, you can directly call, uh, get, the get the model from a database record into the R uh, script and uh, deserialize it as R op op model object and use the predict function directly in the uh, SQL, SQL query and you get the output. Then later on, think about this. This such kind of operationalization enables you that, okay, you build a model, you persist it as a record in the database, and your software engineer does not have to touch base, touch your model directly. What he needs to do is that in the product, he directly calls the store procedure. So that's the, the way how you integrate, how you operationalize your model into a product. And it also, this kind of, it has the enterprise performance and scale. Use SQL servers in memory query and the column store indexes, it can speed up your query. And you can leverage the rebel scale R support for large data sets and parallel algorithms. And easily deploy to Spark cluster by just changing compute context. I think that's another power of this one. So what you need to do is that in, in database analysis, later you, you can see from that Jupyter notebook, what you need to do is that you just need to specify your compute context as a SQL server by providing the credentials to that SQL server, then you're, you're done. Now later on you think, okay, I need to scale up more. Your data is in, in a, a Spark in Hadoop. You just need to change that compute context to the Spark cluster, then you're done, okay? So, this is how the R services in database, how it works. It's, uh, it includes the functionality such as data exploration and predictive modeling. So you, here you have your, uh, your data, uh, data scientist workstation. What you do is that you, through those three lines, you pass your script into the SQL server. A SQL server executes the R script you pass in based on the data resource you refer to. Most likely it can be a SQL query or directly an entire database. Of course, you can make that SQL query as, as much complicated as you want to do some kind of uh, feature engineering such as the pre-screening, something like that. So you, could, you can speed up a lot. Now after the, the execution completes in the SQL server, it passes the results back to your SQL client. Okay, so that's how it works. It, no, it limited to uh, SQL Server 2016. Uh, it is enabled 2016 plus. So after 2017, we also have that that one. In the early version, we don't. Yeah. So and also uh, probably that's a side side talk. Uh, in 2017, we also uh, enabled Python to run in database. Yeah, just probably that's not related to this audience, but just for your information, if you want to later on. You feel comfortable with R, you want to move to Python, that's also one option for you. So in the uh, operationalization part, as I said, the application just calls the uh, store procedure on the SQL server. The SQL server is getting a, a model, you persist it in the database and into the R uh, workspace in the SQL server and make the prediction and output the result to your application. So that's how it works. And what about the libraries? The libraries, you have to make sure the library you want to use, there are two ways. One way is that you have to ask your database administrator to install it for you on the SQL server. Or another thing is that you can, we, we also tried that before, we want to do some kind of uh, plotting on a Google Map object, right? But Google Map is not installed on the, on the SQL server. What you can do is that you can, uh, in your client side, you can get that Google Map object and then pass it as a parameter to your, to your SQL, uh, uh, to your R code when, you're, when you set up your uh, compute context as a SQL server. So if your R square will pass that object into the SQL server and plot and return it back.
So I guess MRO, Mario, probably you know better. So MRO has, is pretty much synced with the open source R, right? Yeah. Does that answer your question? OK. So here, so I guess when people hear uh, Microsoft R, Microsoft SQL Server, it's not free. I cannot use, right? You, I, I'm here. I, I, it's not useful for me. So actually, for your information, we, both products we are going to, I was talking about just now, the Microsoft R and the Microsoft SQL Server, we have free developers version. So here are the links, uh, short links for you to, to, to go to download and, and practice. Okay? Is that a free 30 days or free? Well, it's a free developers version. So you can use for, I, I don't think there's any time limitation. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, here is the GitHub repository for all the codes and scripts we are going to uh, 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 teach today. So you don't have to do anything. Everything has already been either uh, downloaded into the virtual machine uh, you have, or is in the Jupyter Notebook I'm going to show you, and, uh, and you can work with me uh, next. So now let's go to the hands-on part. Uh, if you, can you, Everybody, please open a browser. And uh, in the paper clip you have, there is a Jupyter Notebook server. Uh, keep in mind, it's a HTTPS. And the portal is uh, four lines. So keep in mind, because uh, say around 10 people or 15 people are working will be assigned on the same Jupyter Notebook server. So please uh, try to follow me as much as you can in order to minimize your interface, interference with the other users. So here, if you open this one, you will very likely you will see a kind of warning, security warning. No need to worry about that. You just click on continue uh, depending on what kind of browser you are using. Here, you're go, you, you going to see a, I guess somebody has already been working on this for a while. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so so if, you, if you encounter a kind of uh, uh, a prompt, say you need to input the password, the password is also there. It uh, starts with KDD, K is in uppercase, KDD 2017 at Halifax. Okay, then you open this prepared Jupyter Notebook. There might be another warning. No need to worry. OK. Now, in the first cell, please input a directory name with, that has highly high probability it can be, should be unique inside this room. OK, choose whatever you want, uh, but to be unique, uh, to be sure. And uh, then you can do click on the cell and run all. Click on run all. Then the, there will be a directory created for you under the root directory. Huh? Can you zoom in on your browser a little? OK. Small. Uh, better? Much better. OK. Has everybody completed this task? If I come back, I see uh, this is my one. This is my uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook server. So you might see different on your on the ones assigned to you. So has this been this task been done by all of you?
If you have that done, can you please say if you have your task done and you come back to your to your root directory, you see that directory and you click in, you see a, a file. Uh, it's empty here. Uh, Yeah, you see something here, SQL R services end-to-end -end tutorial in your directory, so you are good. So if you have that done, please uh, come back to, to, your, uh, to this kind of prepared Jupyter notebooks, click on file, and close and hold. That can help others because uh, you are releasing a core assigned to you, okay? How about now? Everybody completed? All done? Who has not completed? Please raise your hand. Okay. Um, there's backup Wi-Fi, just in case they need it. Uh, is that Wi-Fi issue or the kernel issue? Yeah, after you, if you complete, can you please click on that uh, in file and uh, close and hold. That can, that can release the, uh, the course, the kernel. Okay, can we move forward now? Okay, now go to the directory you have and open this uh, SQL R services end-to-end -end tutorial. You might uh, run into another security error. If you have completed the first step, uh, please go to the Open That Jupyter Notebook end-to-end -end SQL R services end-to-end -end tutorial. And in the first cell, input the SQL, per, SQL server information there with the, with the IP address, user ID, and password ID under the section SQL server information in your, uh, on your paperclip.
Okay. Are you with me? Okay. Now let's do step by step. So the first thing you need to do is that in order to do this in database analysis, you need to provide the uh, SQL uh, login information. So here we are pro you are specifying the SQL Server. Keep in mind the SQL Server IP should be should not be your Jupyter Notebook IP. Okay. Uh, the user ID and password. So the password is always in the pattern KDD case in uppercase, 17 at Halifax underscore a four digit red number. It's on your paper clip. You run it. Now the second thing is that you install the necessary libraries if missing. So those are the libraries we are going to use. So here, keep in mind, you are installing this library on, your, uh, on the local machine, on the basically Jupyter Notebook server. But this one, this one should run very fast because all the most libraries have been pre-installed. And then you run, uh, you add a local library directory to, to the lab path, which is also the lab path is uh, uh, pointing to a uh, path on the Jupyter Notebook server. Now, if you run the fourth one, it will confirm that you are running under your own directory. You see, you should see, see the directory name. So this directory name will be used. Sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. Better. Okay. Now, let's do some uh, more serious. Uh, in database analysis, we have already prepared pretty much what, what is needed uh, to run this uh, in database analysis. So the first thing is that you need to create a uh, connection string. In this connection string, you are specifying your driver and uh, your database information. Here we are using the database uh, <coughs> New York uh, City taxi data. So basically, it records all the rides uh, in NYC in 2013. It is a some small subsample of the data. So it has information such as the pickup location, drop off lo location, the uh, uh, pickup time, drop off time, uh, uh, payment uh, type, uh, tip amount, total uh, cost, something like that. So you specify that, and then you also specify a uh, temporary directory to series R job uh, R object back and forth, and here this is how you create the uh, uh, compute context. Here is CC. You uh, this is a function called Rx in SQL Server. The parameters provided to this function, including the connection string you specified, the shared directory, uh, and the uh, SQL uh, output. Uh, console output equals the SQL output, then you uh, run. So this set up the compute context as your, uh, and also Rx set compute context is set in here, I'm compute, I'm, my compute context is, is the SQL server, in this SQL server specified by my, by this previous line. Okay, now, as I said, the, uh, your, uh, your data source in, 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 in database analysis, your data source can be an entire, uh, entire table or can be a uh, query result. So here I'm querying, I'm, my data source is specified as a query result. I'm selecting the tipped. Tipped is a binary variable. Here is the uh, our classification task label column. We are, we are classifying whether this ride is tipped or not by the passenger. And the, uh, some other variables such as tip amount, fare amount, passenger count, et cetera. And also I'm casting the uh, pickup, pick longitude, latitude, and drop off locations as float. Okay. Then you can, you also specify uh, the, uh, the levels of a factor variable such as payment type. And now you, here you, use the Rx SQL Server data to create a 
object called in data source. If you click run, so here, keep in mind this is kind of uh, Rx in database analysis is kind of lazy process. Uh, now you you actually you just specify in data source as a reference to a to the query result. It does not really run the query yet. So if you have this done, now let's do the uh, do some uh, data exploration to understand what kind of data we have. Uh, go to the section of data exploration. Click run. It will get the uh, column information from the query, and also we are uh, we are also doing some kind of arc summary to summarize in the relationship between fare amount and the passenger count. So you can see that okay the. Uh, Fair amount, when the passenger count equals one, the mean value is $12. When it is two, it is 12.87. So you see that probably looks like the uh, ride with two passengers has the highest uh, tip amount. Don't know whether it is consistent with your experience or not. Are we done here? Now, we understand, let's understand the relationship between the tip amount, passenger count, and the trip uh, distance in the, in the sample data. So we called a function called Rx cube. It is doing, uh, the formula is like this tip amount as, a, as my uh, target variable. Uh, my, uh, my experimental variable will be passenger count as a, as a factor, and also trip distance as a, also another factor. So you run this. It might be, oh, it, it is coming out with this table. So, okay, that's a Wi-Fi problem, you think? <laughs> okay, is that, is that error coming out from the, uh, you run some cell here, or it's a, Okay. Yeah. 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 So in order to say, here, here is how it works. Uh, I, I can show you later on. So I guess your major concern is that do I have to use rebel scale R? You want to run this, right? So here, when you, when you say, when you set up the compute context as the SQL server, yes. now when you run this kind of Rx function, it is actually sending the, the, the script to the SQL server, and run it there, process data you refer to, either a SQL, a, a SQL query result or table, something like that. You run there and get the result. The result is then passed back to your client. So here's a, here are two parts here. One is SQL Server, one is the client. The client is the one you are working on now. The Jupyter Notebook is a client. Yes. And this, the, there is another server which, is, uh, is, ha, which has the information here, right? That's another machine. Okay, so, here, so the R is on SQL Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So now hopefully uh, this function, uh, this cell has been completed. You can see the kind of statistics uh, of the, uh, say, tip amount, uh, something like that. And so now we can do the data visualization. The data visualization here, we are, we are plotting two histograms. One is the uh, distribution of tip amount over the payment type. The other histogram we are plotting is the fair amount histogram. Uh, okay, now here you also you, spe uh, you specify that your, your data is, is the in data source. That's the data source you, ref you created just now. It's a query in SQL. And now let's run it.
So here is the scene. Mm, there are two parts. First of all, uh, Revel, as I said, has a free developer version, right? If you want to try it out, you have to learn. That's free, right? Of course, when you want, when you go to production lines, that's another story, right? Uh, the second thing is that later I'm, I'm going to show you the SQL SQL. The the R script that can be run in SQL query can be any R script. Okay. It does not have to be the uh, rebel scale uh, R. But it's because you don't want to lose data. Yeah, yeah, your data is big, and also if you if you want to say here because I'm I'm showing you the environment here, you have a client, you have a server. Now, you, if you want to do the send the uh, code from client to the SQL uh, SQL server to run, you have to run some kind of RxX function to run that. But in that RxX function, uh, later I'm also going to show you, you can say basically you are running a Rx data step. Rx data step is doing some kind of data processing for you, but the data processing itself can be any R. You see, you, you, you are just using Rx function to send this R to SQL, but that R itself can be anything, any R. Okay. So here, now it looks like we have, oops, it failed somehow. <laughs> Let me try it again. Probably I'm, I'm competing with uh, someone else who is also using the same resource as me. Uh, here, the uh, for your information, the SQL server I'm using is just a single machine, with probably eight cores, something like that. So, of course, in many case situation, the R server can be much much more powerful than this, right? So, in this way, you can it can give you more power. So, you see, okay. Mario, do you, know, do you know how the kind of resource management happens on the SQL server? Yeah, server side, resource management. So on SQL server, um, the R processes are managed by the SQL server system, which has a lot of capabilities for controlling the memory and CPU that can be allowed uh, to different sub tasks within SQL Server. So I think it's initially configured to allow R to use, I believe, 20% of the resources, but that's configurable. Yeah, okay. So it looks like I uh, managed to compete against some other uh, users on this machine. I got my result. This is the uh, uh, histogram for the uh, tip amount over payment type. And also the this is the my tip amount, uh, uh, payment type, uh, fair amount over the, uh, over what over the let me see the function, uh, yeah the, the fair amount uh, distribution. Now, let's do some kind of uh, function to do the feature engineering using. The feature engineering function is defined in using open source R, right? You see here, this is purely the open source R function. You see here, the function is just calculating the, a very simple naive function to calculate the direct distance between the pickup location and the drop off location. Right? It's pure uh, open source R, there's no um, uh, rebel here. But of course, when you run this one, when you want, if you want to submit your uh, code to be run on SQL Server, you need to you call this kind of Rx the SQL Server data function to uh, actually R, Rx data step. Here, the feature data source is just a holder for the feature engineering result. It's, uh, it's, it is hosted as a table. You see here, the table is called the username features. So later on, if you run it, a, a complete running, you will see something like, say, my name is HNGZH underscore features. This is a table which is used to host as the output 
of your this uh, this function. So you click run. So you see here, it completes. It takes around how many seconds? Uh, 0 0.38 seconds uh, elapsed, 7.5 seconds to complete. If I come back to the SQL Server and I see, you see here, I see you, uh, my table is here. I see some other uh, Halifax run uh, features there. I guess some people uh, were even moving much faster than my uh, than my process. You, you have already uh, scored out some of the uh, complete some of the, the later parts. Okay. So now, of course, as I said, uh, many 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 functions can be uh, features can be directly uh, extracted by using SQL query, right? So here, if you feel, my uh, suggestion is that if you feel some functions can be easily done in SQL, do that, because that's my, that will be more efficient than you write everything in R, right? So because I guess SQL is running um, a very efficient way in uh, written in C or C sharp, C++, right? It can be used, some, many cases can be much faster. So if you can't do things in SQL, Query directly do that. Do not have, you do not have to use the uh, write everything in R, right? So now you see here we have we are doing roughly the same thing. We are calling a store procedure called dbofn calculate distance, which is using the same information to calculate the direct distance between um, between pickup and drop off location, and then you run it. Again, here, the feature data source here, it is, the, it is referring to a table here. It is referring to a table in the SQL Server. The feature data source, it does not actually go back to your, to your client side. It stays in the SQL Server. Okay, now, that's just a true uh, uh, toy example of how to do feature engineering in database using either R or using uh, the uh, SQL uh, store procedure or function defined. So now let's train a logistic regression, regression model to predict the tipped, the binary classification using the passenger count, trip distance, trip time in seconds, direct distance. Direct distance is the feature we generated using, previously we used that uh, function we defined in, the, in SQL. Now you run it. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Better? Uh, I, I hope this one works. Uh, it looks like it does not work so much. Okay, so oh, it failed again. I guess it's uh, another kind of competing resources. Uh, let me try it again. Okay, you see the model is out. This is summary of this model of the coefficients. You see the positive uh, uh, impact, uh, negative impact on the passenger count, and trip distance negative, uh, trip dist time in seconds positive impact, and direct distance positive. Okay, so now uh, let's do the um, model prediction. Uh, using the trend logistic regression model. Here we are specifying the outputting the uh, predicted result to another table called username underscore uh, score output. You are using the Rx predict function. Here again, if you are using Rx predict, it is sending the code to the uh, SQL server and run it there and get the result.
Huh, again, failed because of competing uh, resources. Run it again. Uh, failed. I guess I guess I'm running out of uh, time on my part. So let me give you a kind of brief introduction of how you persist a model as a uh, as a record in your database. Uh, let me see. Go to let me open this one. Persist model and modify. Let me zoom in. So basically, how to persist the model as a record in database is that you create a, pro, a, store, a store procedure, and here you can what you do is that you you convert your model into a, a binary string and insert this one this record as a record into your uh, into your table. Probably you cannot see. Uh, I was trying to to zoom in. Okay, can you see better now? So this is how it works. You just insert a NYC in, into a table where it's two columns here. I'm, we ha I only have two columns, model, modeler, values here. The model is converted into a, uh, into a binary uh, string and, al uh, and also the model information is also passed by, passed into this store procedure when you call this procedure in R. Let me do this, come this back. Okay, now if you if I come back to this Jupyter notebook, you see here. Uh, say here, this is how you call the uh, store procedure. First, you serialize your model into a binary and convert this one into a binary string, and you pass this string into the uh, into this query, into the store procedure, and you run this query by using the RODBC. That's how the, this model is persisted. Now later on, say you want to consume this model, how to do that? So this is the store procedure uh, we have for predict the, uh, by calling this model to predict, uh, predict the uh, new observation. Here's the, how it works. So you see here, in my, this is my um, this is my uh, SQL Server. You don't have access to that, but uh, but later I'm going to release that one, push this one to the to the uh, GitHub. So you should have it there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah by the way, so the GitHub rep GitHub link, right? We we provide the, it's in the bottom of your paper clip, right? It's not there yet, but we are going to promise we are going to push it there, so you can you can take it for uh, afterwards. Another resource you can refer to uh, is that the, uh, in Azure, we have a data science virtual machine in Windows and Ubuntu. If you choose Windows, it's already there. Yeah, the, you can use the uh, $150 free credit uh, to, to provision a virtual machine there and then, then practice a little bit on that, okay? So you see here, this is how, we, how this model is, is used. So first of all, 
It is uh, the model is passed in as a string. You see here, this, this is model as a string. And then in here, you are, you are just calling some here. You specify your SP execute external script as R. You can uh, you take this pass the model as a string and unserialize it as a model object, and then you use this Rx predict function to predict. Then you uh, get the output. Okay, so uh, that's the way to operationalize the model as a store procedure. I guess I'm pretty much. Running, let me have another try to see whether it works. I really want to show. Okay, you see here, I'm down here predicting, Rx predict. Now I want to re-evaluate this model. This is mass, uh, the last content I would like to talk about uh, for me now. So here we are switching back and forth between local computer context and uh, uh, in database computer context. Here, so w w when I switch back to the local computer context, here I need to Im uh, import the data from a SQL server using the Rx import, the store output, the, which is defined previously. And uh, I import this one as a local data frame. And th then I run some uh, Rx ROC curve to plot the, uh, the ROC plot. So here, the data is not good because we, in, uh, in NYC text data, if you, if you include the payment type into your modeling, you get over 95% accurate. But if you don't have that one, that's, the data is very noisy. The, the reason why the payment type is very important because if you pay by cash, the driver will not report any tip. If you pay by credit card, the driver has no way to hide that such income, right? So that's the, that's the reason. So then after you, you are done with the local computer context, you see here, if you have the local computer context, you, have, you are reading the data actually from the server, SQL server into your local. And, uh, but hopefully, when you do this, you are only do, uh, work, working on small data sets, so the transferring data is not, will not be a problem anymore. And after that, you want to uh, switch back again. You, you set the compute context to be the, uh, to be the SQL server again. Then you, are in, then you are doing in database analysis again. Okay, I guess for the sake of time, I'm stopping here. So next will be uh, Mario. Uh, And uh, for that, we're going to be using actually completely different machines. So if you, if you had trouble, I know a few people had trouble with their browsers getting out to the SQL Server machine. Maybe maybe this uh, their address will be more amenable to you. On your slips of paper, uh, there's a row on the slip of paper that says Spark on single node, and those that's the information you should refer to for connecting to these um, these Spark machines. I'll give you some more information on the Spark machines, but if you want to get a head start on connecting to those machines, you can go to the the GitHub page. Um, the URL for the GitHub page is at the bottom of the slip of paper, and uh, just scroll through the README until you get to the part that says connecting to the data science virtual machine. And there we have instructions for connecting, whether you're connecting from a Windows machine or from a Linux or Mac machine. Um, so uh, that's, that's all provided uh, on the, at that URL. And then just use the IP address, username and password under Spark on single node on the slip of paper. What's the question? The page link is on the bottom of the slip of paper that we handed out. Just go to that page, that, go to that link on the bottom of that slip of paper. 
All right. Let's dive into the content for distributed computing on Spark using R. By the way, my name is Mario Inchiosa, and I'm on the team that has been working for the past couple of years to integrate R with Spark at Microsoft. Mario? Yes. Yes, yeah, so once you go to the GitHub, you scroll down to where it says connecting to data science virtual machine, and there we provide um, instructions for both Windows and Linux for the SSH commands. Yeah. And if you need any help, just raise your hand, and uh, my three other colleagues will be happy to help out. Very good. So uh, if you are new to Spark, uh, Spark is a, an open source library. It's an Apache library for supporting distributed computing. And it supports four languages, Scala, Java, Python, and R. Now, it also supports four different computation paradigms. One is called Spark SQL, where you're working with structured data similar to a SQL table. Uh, Spark Streaming, that allows you to work with streaming data in what are called mini-batches. Spark MLlib, which is a machine learning library, and GraphX, a graph computation library. And these libraries can all be run on um, various clusters. They can be run on YARN clusters, which um, are pretty much the successor to the original Hadoop MapReduce clusters, so YARN or Mesos. You can also run Spark locally on the multiple cores of a workstation or server. And you can run Spark in standalone Spark cluster mode where um, it doesn't use a, a schedule, it doesn't use a resource negotiator, it, it just runs the whole, uh, Spark on the whole cluster. So I'll be talking about several different R packages that allow you to make use of Spark. And the first one I'll mention is Spark R. And the reason why I'm starting with Spark R is because Spark R is actually from Apache Spark. So it's included with Apache Spark. Whenever you have Apache Spark, you also have Spark R. So it's nice to know that the versions are always synced. It basically gives you functionality to um, most, if not all, of the functions available in Spark. Uh, using the R language. The most important thing it allows you to do is it allows you to create what's called a Spark data frame. And a Spark data frame is a similar to an R data frame or similar to a SQL table in that it has named columns, each column being a single data type. And uh, what Spark R lets you do is it allows you to move data between the Spark data frame, which is distributed across the memory of the Spark cluster, and you can bring the data source the data from a local R data frame, uh, but that's not very scalable. Uh, but the scalable approaches are you can also create Spark data frames from files that are in many different formats, such as CSV, JSON, and Parquet. And these files can be stored in the HDFS distributed file system, so they can be very large files. You can have one giant CSV file, for example. It will be distributed across many nodes, and it will be consumed by many parallel workers. You also can access data that's stored in Hive on the cluster. And uh, these, as I mentioned, since it comes with Spark, it's basically pre-configured with, 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 with Spark in, in clusters, including what's called Microsoft Azure HD Insight, uh, which is a Spark cluster in the cloud that we'll be seeing a little more of. The data processing capabilities in Spark are, include functions for working with structured data, so your typical SQL-like functions like select and filter, doing uh, aggregations, doing uh, something that's not very typical in SQL, being able to run R functions. Now, we saw we can run R functions in SQL Server, but uh, the Spark R library also allows us to run R functions, apply R functions to our data um, uh, using the so-called spark.lapply function. And uh, 
that returns all of its results back to the R session. So it's not as scalable as the next thing, which is the dapply function and the gapply function. These functions will, 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 will process large distributed data using an R function of your specification and then return the results back to distributed storage. So they're not facing any bottleneck where they have to return all the results back to one R session. Now, in addition to those functions for processing structured data, uh, Spark R also provides wrappers to the machine learning functions in the MLlib library, which uh, provide a nice range of functions for machine learning. A similarly named package is the Sparkly R package. Now, don't confuse Spark R and Sparkly R because Spark R, as I mentioned, comes with Spark. Sparkly R is another contributed open source package started by the folks at R Studio. And it offers, um, since it's not already pre-installed, you can run an R function install.packages sparkly R to install it. And then it will allow you to use the normal functionality of Spark. For example, as I mentioned, running locally with the multiple cores of a single node or running distributed across a yarn cluster. And um, again, it provides an interface to Spark data frames. In principle, very similar to Spark R, but it has one advantage or distinction versus Spark R, which is that it supports the dplyr R, um, R functions, which are really popular functions in, in normal single node open source R, but now they also work with Spark in a distributed fashion. So anyone who has written many R scripts over the years and come to love the dplyr R library, you can now apply that, that knowledge in a Spark cluster using the Sparkly R package. Another uh, package that's available for um, exploiting Spark from R is the H2O package. Um, the H2O package has an integration with Spark called R Sparkling. It also interfaces with Sparkly R, interoperates nicely, and it allows you to um, uh, use the other algorithms that are provided by H2O. So with both Spark R and Sparkly R, you're using the MLlib algorithms built into Spark. But with H2O, you have an additional set of algorithms that were written by the H2O folks. So now you have more choices in algorithms that you can use. One differentiation is since those algorithms were written separately from the MLlib algorithms, they, they require the data to be in what's called an H2O frame. But there's a function that'll allow you to um, create an H2O frame from a Spark data frame and vice versa. And finally, um, one other package that I'll talk about is the R server package, Microsoft R server, that provides interface to Spark from R. So that package is built upon open source R, so you can run all of your normal open source R functions. It provides functions for parallelizing your uh, open source R functions. And it also provides a, a wide range of algorithms that um, are written internally in C++, but are exposed as R functions. And additionally, recently we've added a package called Microsoft ML that includes additional ML algorithms and featureizers. And those are written in C Sharp and are based on algorithms that have been developed across Microsoft in Microsoft Research and Bing. So this package gives you access to some uh, really battle-tested algorithms that have been used at scale. The another the distinction of the Revo Scale R and Microsoft R server R functions is that they are not restricted to Spark, but can be used with or without Spark. They can be used on a single Windows or Linux server. They can be used, as we saw earlier today, in a SQL server. And they can be used with Spark or Teradata database. Um, so they basically provide whenever you write a function with these Revo Scale R functions, you, you want to specify what your algorithm is. You want to specify what your data source is and what, where you want the computation to happen, which we, we call the compute context. So we have portions of the library for each of those purposes. And then we also have a capability for operationalization uh, called MRS deploy. And what we mean by operationalization is um, within the enterprise, there are maybe a lot of applications that want to make use of your machine learning function, but they're not necessarily written in R. So operationalization allows you to publish an R-based function or model and make it available as a web service. And then 
something like 30 different languages could access those web services. And we even provide um, Swagger uh, specifications of the web services so you can generate um, the AP, you can generate the code to connect to the web services from these 30 different languages essentially automatically using the Swagger tool. So now we're going to move on to the hands-on portion of the Spark, uh, the first of several. For the rest of the day, we're going to be using these Spark, um, we're going to be using R on Spark. Um, and um, one thing I will mention in terms of timing is that we are going to have a coffee break from 3.30 to 4, so don't feel like you'll be stuck in your seats uh, indefinitely this afternoon. There will be a nice break to stretch your legs. Um, so you're going to be using what's called the Data Science Virtual Machine, which is a virtual machine we've made available in Azure that um, comes in both Windows and Linux versions, as well as multiple Linux versions. There's Ubuntu and, um, and CentOS. We're going to be using the Ubuntu Linux virtual machine. And this virtual machine is really handy because it comes with a lot of different data science tools pre-installed for you. So you can save a lot of time downloading TensorFlow, downloading CNTK, Rattle, Jupyter, they're all already installed on the data science virtual machine. So uh, the information that is on your little slips of paper is, uh, is, is, is pointing you to your own personal virtual machine. We're not sharing machines anymore now. We've actually created 150 of these virtual machines, so everyone has their own. Another way to run these functions is on uh, which call, what's called HD Insight, which is our Hadoop clusters in the cloud. Um, these clusters uh, have both Spark and R installed and configured. They support multiple versions of Spark and R. So uh, if we've moved on to maybe Spark 2.1, but you're still using Spark 1.6, it's okay. We still have that cluster there in the cloud for you to use. And from these clusters, you can access cloud storage, including Azure Blob Storage, Azure Data Lake Store, or the local distributed file system of the cluster, the local HDFS. And using clusters like this, you're not limited to one node. You can have hundreds of nodes, and you can scale up your computation to billions of rows and terabytes of data. So that's the advantage of, of having a true cluster in the cloud. Now, the tutorial is going to use as an example the problem of predicting airline arrival delay. And uh, in the tutorial, I wanted to combine Show, show how we could combine multiple R packages. So in the first part of the tutorial, we're going to do cleaning and joining of data sets using the Sparkly R package I mentioned. And then we're going to do training, scoring, and evaluating of models with VivoScale R from our server. We'll be working with our server the whole time, but we'll be using different packages at different points in the tutorial, different libraries, just to show off that they can be used for interoperation. And finally, we will deploy our prediction function as a web service using the MRS deploy package. We'll be using two data sets here, um, a passenger flight on time performance data set um, and then a weather data set with hourly weather observations from 2000 weather stations. So now we can give PowerPoint a break and switch to uh, the hands-on part and um, First, I'm going to just demonstrate how you do connect to these virtual machines, uh, the data science virtual machine and the HD Insight machine. So for the data, for the data science virtual machine, uh, you're going to want to start a terminal window, either, um, yeah, start a terminal window, either the CMD command prompt in Windows, or you could use SIGWIN SSH if you have that on Windows, or Mobi Xterm on Windows, or the command, um, the bash command prompt, in Linux or the command prompt on a Mac. And then you're going to want to use SSH or P-Link on Windows to connect to the virtual machine with the forwarding of two ports because we're going to be accessing two different URLs on the virtual machines to display um, our studio and to display a, um, an interface called the Yarn UI that shows you what is running on the node. So uh, the Command for Windows is P, if you if you down, if you need to download P-Link, we provide that link in um, 
the GitHub. So I hope everyone has found their way to the GitHub and has scrolled down to the part where it says connecting to data science virtual machine. And there you'll just notice that there's a bullet for Windows and there's a bullet for Linux or Mac. Now if you have SIGWIN SSH on Windows, then you can use the Linux instructions. Uh, just use this, run this SSH command or the plink.exe command. Uh, the dash capital L switch to forward the local host 8787 port and another dash L command to forward local host 8088. That will connect you to the machines. And if you are having any trouble connecting to the virtual machines, do raise your hand. And um, uh, I see a few hands up so we can get help to you. If you have a general question. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come over, we'll, some of my colleagues will come by. Do you have a general question or a specific question? Oh, we'll zoom the window some more, sure. Mm -hmm. I will. Make my font larger. The, once again, the URL for all these instructions is printed at the very bottom of your slip of paper. So I have run the plink command, um, which has made, given my SSH connection to my virtual machine. That's all I'm going to do at that with the, with plink or SSH is just create these tunnels, then leave them open so that you can connect to our studio. So the next step is to go to your web browser and type in, and maybe I'll make this even a little bigger. Although the URL part doesn't get bigger that way. Actually, is this um, audible? I'm not sure I'm a, as loud with this microphone. I'll keep using this microphone. Um, yes. Uh, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. There we go. I've got the lavalier working now. So, yeah, go to HTTP. It's, this is written down on the GitHub, but just in case you're having trouble locating that, go to HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8787. That port is being forwarded now from your laptop to the virtual machine in the cloud. And what, we'll, what you will see there is um, you will be brought into our studio. Any passwords you need to supply are on this piece of paper. Now, if you haven't used RStudio before, I'll just guide you through how we will get to the files in this part of the tutorial. Uh, in the files pane, in the lower right-hand corner of RStudio, you'll see a directory listed, KDD2017R. Just click on that directory. Then you'll see a directory under that called code. This is where all the code is. So click on code, and now we have um, about six or seven directories of code. The directory we want to go to for this part of the tutorial is MRS, Microsoft R Server. So click on MRS, and now you'll find the actual R scripts that we're going to use for this part of the tutorial. We're going to start off with script number one, which is labeled one clean join. So click on one clean join, and that will bring up uh, a, an editor window with script one. Let me scroll to the top of script one. Now, um, let's get started here. The first step we're going to do is we're going to run um, line by line through this script. So um, the way you can run line by line in RStudio is just by hitting control enter. Each time you hit control enter, it will execute another line and move the cursor down. So I'll hit control enter over that set working directory command and then control enter to source the set compute context dot R. Uh, what set compute context does, dot R does is it loads some environment variables and specifies some directories where data is stored. And then we're going to load the sparkly R and the dplyr libraries. Because we'll start with sparkly R in this part of the, the um, tutorial. We'll also set an environment variable specifying the spark version on this um, on this virtual machine. And then we're going to run this command here, rx spark connect. 
Now, Arc Spark Connect is going to start the Spark process, a start application, Spark application running that allows you to use both the sparkly R commands and the R server Rx functions. OK. We have uh, one more hand in the back there for asking for some help with seeing or logging in. OK. The plier, the packages are already installed and loaded on the virtual machine. Yes. Now, um, oh, Bob, I, I think this uh, woman in the third row had a question. So we can see now what's happening on the virtual machine by going to that other address I mentioned. If we go to localhost colon 8088, 8088, that will bring us to the um, the Yarn user interface for the cluster. And what you'll see there is you may s you'll see that um, there's now an application that's, whose name is sparklyr-sparkr, and it should be in state running. You can also see that the cluster, this single node virtual machine, has 8 gigabytes available for, for, for Spark to use. Once that application is running, it'll be using 7 of those 8 gigabytes. And uh, also, if you scroll to the right under the Yarn UI, you'll see, hopefully, that there's one active node. If something happens with your node, like you run out of disk space, then you will have, instead of an active node, you'll have an unhealthy node. So that's a way to check the status of your cluster. So it'll take maybe a minute to two minutes, well, usually under two minutes, to start your Spark application. But now the Spark application is running and is waiting to take commands to run across the um, executors, they're called, in Spark. Now, um, just to, uh, actually, I'll continue here in this RStudio window for a few more commands. The next command we want to run is the rx get sparkly r connection command. What that does is, I was mentioning that we're going to be able to use both the dplyr r commands and the sparkly r commands as well as the uh, revo scale r functions. This variable that I just defined here, sc, sc is the Spark context that's used by the sparkly R commands. So now we want to specify our data sources. And we'll use sparkly R spark read CSV function, which is going to read both the airline and the weather data from CSV files, and it will read it. It'll essentially create a, a reference to that data. And as, once it's necessary, it will read it into memory. But Spark tends to use lazy evaluation, so it doesn't often do your the computations you're requesting until you actually ask for a result. And then it will do all of the computations. One thing to note here is you may get an error if you run just this first line alone, the first one to, do, to read the airline data. That's just an error from RStudio. It's a little bug that they fixed in the latest version that uh, we're trying to populate this, this, this list of tables on the, in the upper right. And when there's only one table, it has an issue. So I'm going to, it, it doesn't actually stop it from working. It's just an annoying warning error. But if I run both the first, the airline and the weather reading, both of those in at the same time, then I won't get that error. So it's first reading the airline data. It's going to use the header information in those CSV files to name the columns. How large are those CSV files? They're not very large because um, we scaled everything down to fit on the data science virtual machine. So the data science virtual machine is very good for um, developing code. It can be used for, actually, it's, it's licensed for development. Um, you can provision a rather large data science virtual machine with, you know, many cores in RAM, but here we have a, a modest size one with four cores and 28 gigabytes of RAM. Yeah, so we'll see the count of rows at the end of this first script. Yeah. Okay, so it's finished, and you'll see uh, over in your upper right-hand corner, you'll see the Spark UI is integration in, in, uh, with RStudio is showing that you've created two Spark data frames, an airline one and a weather one. Now I'm going to switch over to HD Insights so that I can show you that how this also looks when you're running on, the, on the, um, the cluster in the cloud instead of the single node in the cloud. And actually, uh, I'll point out that when you create one of these HD Insight clusters, you have a, a kind of a, 
overview page of the cluster, which includes a link to dashboards. And then connecting to the RStudio server uh, is, is a little bit easier. You don't have to worry about the SSH command. You simply click on this RStudio server button. And connecting to the Yarn UI also is a, a simple button you press um, that takes you right to that UI. So um, uh, also on the uh, HD Insight version, we have a slightly um, older version of RStudio, so we don't have the Spark pane in the upper right-hand corner. So now we've done the uh, airline and weather uh, files. Now we're going to do some transforming of the data. We're going to rename some columns. We're using normal dplyr rename syntax here. We're going to select some columns, leave out some columns that we're not interested in. We're going to do some simple math operations, such as uh, dividing the departure time by 100 and taking the floor, which will round down to a full hour. We can even do a little more complicated things while we're doing some more renaming on the weather data. And now we're going to average the weather readings by hour. So this is a little bit trickier. It does a group by over the, the date and time and the airport ID. So if there's more than one reading, weather reading in a particular hour, it will average together those readings. So we have exactly one weather reading per hour. And you'll see that as I run these commands, they're running essentially instantly. That's because it's really using lazy evaluation, and it's just taking note of the changes that we're asking for. Um, the next thing we're going to do is a join, and this is a, a so-called natural left join. I must have missed a command earlier because I got an error there. So actually, I'm going to go to my other window, maybe. Go back to the data science virtual machine. So when we do the left join, it tells us conveniently that the, the columns in, in common between the two data frames are the year, month, day of month, destination airport ID, and departure time, or CRS depart time columns. So it's going to join on those columns. This will join the, weather, the airline data with the weather at the destination airport. And uh, I think I might have skipped the origin airport uh, when I selected all those lines. So we, there's some more renaming. And now we have to, um, now what we're going to do is, our data has been in a Spark data frame. But we can use this Spark data frame register command, SDF register, to make it visible as a SQL table. And then we can do SQL queries on it. We can also run the ca table cache command, which loads the table into memory, um, it actually materializes the table in memory. So now is when the lazy evaluation has to end and Spark is really being asked to uh, materialize the table. So this is where the whole machinery will be running of Spark to read all of the data, do the renames and aggregations and joins. And once that happens, the data is cached in memory, and queries on the data after that are very quick. So now it's finished that um, process. Now we can run a query, such as uh, select count star from flights weather. So that'll tell us how many rows do we have in this join table. And we see that we have uh, 1.9 million rows. The nice thing about it being in memory is we could have a billion rows, and it would also answer queries very, very quickly in a matter of a seconds uh, because of it being stored in memory. We can also do you know, a whole variety of SQL queries. Like We can look at this RDEL15 column, which is a binary column specifying whether the flight was delayed by 15 minutes or more. If it's a 1, that means the flight was delayed by 15 minutes or more. And in that case, we see that there are 300,000 delayed flights. Uh, but the data set's somewhat imbalanced. There are actually 1.5 million not delayed flights. And the other thing we can do we can see easily with a SQL query, is uh, we can see what, what are the counts for a year and month in this data set. So this data set is a subset of the full airline data set. And uh, what we're seeing is that it contains data for 2011, the year 2011 and 2012, the months January and February in each of those years, and about an equal number of rows for each of the months, each of those four months. 
So now we've done a lot of our data wrangling using the dplyr um, library. And we're going to use the RevoScaleR library now to, to do some data modeling. Uh, first step in our data modeling will be to um, split out the training data and the testing data. So the training data will be data for, um, for flights before the year 2012. So we'll train on 2011. And then we'll be testing. We'll register that as a, a table called flights weather train. And we'll also split out the testing data as um, testing data will be January of 2012. So we're using data from 2011 to make predictions about 2012. We, uh, by the way, there's a warning message you'll see, which is safe to ignore. I made a note of that in the file. So we're going to register the flight data as well. And now we're going to um, create, uh, if you recall, I mentioned that in the RevoScaleR library, you specify the algorithm you want to run, the data source, and the so-called compute context. Here we're going to specify the data source um, using this call info, uh, which is kind of a familiar R construct, where we can specify the types of the different columns, including our so-called factor columns. So I will specify the call info. And I will now use this Rx hive data function to specify that we're getting our data from this so-called hive table. It's an in-memory temporary table created by Spark called flights weather. And we will also call the Rx create call info function. That's going to scan the table and pick up all of those factor levels. So uh, we don't have to enter them manually. And it will find that the year is a two-level factor with 2011 and 2012 as the factor levels, for example. So that's done. Um, now we can specify um, a data source for our training data and the dating source, data source for our testing data. And we're also going to save our testing data as, a, as an XDF file, which is a binary file. It's actually a, it's, it's called a composite XDF in, in, in HDFS Spark storage because it, it, it's a composite of many files. So it allows us to read and write the file in parallel. And it'll allow us to demonstrate reading from a file and calling the operationalization service in the next script. OK. Now we're going to train and test the logistic regression model. We'll start by specifying a formula for that model using R's normal formula language. We can make this window a little larger. And we're predicting, as I mentioned, this binary variable arrival delay 15 minutes or more using uh, information about month, day of month, day of week, carrier, airport ID, as well as all this weather data we joined, such as humidity and, and um, alt, um, pre barometric pressure and wind speed. So that's our formula. And now we call the scalable, oops, I erased it. We call the scalable Rx logit function, which will perform a logistic regression uh, using Spark and, and using the the C++ code that is part of the R server library. That's an iterative algorithm. So we will see it per perform about eight iterations or so. I think it's around eight iterations for this particular case. And um, each iteration, we'll, we'll see a little progress report. And we'll see about, we're seeing about eight, eight to nine seconds per iteration. Um, now, this can be run on the HD Insight cluster with more nodes to scale it to a virtually infinite number of rows. Sure. So different libraries have different strengths. And um, we have some performance comparisons in the deck where uh, we are seeing advantages in using the Microsoft Arcs logit function, for example, compared to, um, compared to the uh, corresponding functions in MLlib or H2O. Um, but it does depend on exactly what features you need in the function, whether you need regularization, whether you need to easily handle, fa handle factor levels, or do you need to handle lots of, like, a hundreds of thousands of columns, which you sometimes need with text featureization and machine learning. So it's, 
simply uh, more variety in functions, essentially. Yes? Can I do things like GLM maps, uh, like L1 and L2 regularly? That we can do with um, the Rx logistic regression function in the Microsoft ML library. So there is a, a function for that as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So it's finished. And if we run the summary function in typical R fashion, we can see what our coefficients are. And it will show um, it will show a listing here of coefficients. We can see that the day and month coefficients have three stars next to them, so those those estimates are highly significant. If it had printed out more rows, we would also see the weather ones um, are quite significant. And now we can do we've done the training. Now we can do our prediction on the test data set. So we specify a data file where we, where we will write our predictions, and we call the scalable Rx predict function, which will take our test data, apply the model to it, and write out the predictions. Once we've done the predictions, we will then use those predictions and we'll compare the predicted label with the true label, the ground truth, uh, to generate an ROC curve and to measure the area under that ROC curve. So I will also highlight and run those, those functions. So we've finished the prediction. Now it's running the RX ROC. And once that's done, it will show up as a plot in the plot window of R Studio. So we see an AUC of 0.64. It's better than chance, but it's not extremely high, which means that these, these predictors don't tell us definitely when the, whether the flight's going to be delayed, but they do give us some, um, some information on, on, on when it will be, on how likely it is to be delayed. Now, um, we have another example here, which uses a uh, interesting machine learning model, which is called the bag of boosted trees model. So here we can, uh, boosted trees are normally not, like, not easy to parallelize because you create one tree after another when you're creating gradient boosted trees. But if you create a so-called bag of boosted trees, you can divide your data into n partitions, create a boosted tree on each partition, and then um, use that ensemble model to do your predicting. That's what we do here in the next few lines. And if I run that, it runs, You'll see surprisingly fast, even faster than the logistic regression. And that's a little surprising that boosted trees uh, will be faster than logistic regression. But it's just because it parallelizes so well. And we're using an efficient uh, implementation here. And this one really, um, really runs quite quickly. Uh, after running the ensemble model, we can also, we also have lines here for running prediction with the Rx trees ensemble and for doing an ROC curve. And the ROC curve looks similar, it's like slightly higher AUC with the boosted bag of boosted trees. So actually, the logistic regression model was not bad at all um, as far as the AUC could achieve for this data set. Finally, I'm going to just skip over that prediction in the interest of time, and I'm going to run the arc spark disconnect line. I think you should also run that line. That will close down the Spark application. Um, the resources are then available to other jobs you may run. So run the Rx Spark disconnect. Um, and now we'll run, move on to the third and final part of this uh, script. And this part is about the operationalization of, of, of um, the function that we just, the model we just created, the logistic regression model. So we're going to, again, set our working directory and source our compute context.r. We'll make sure our compute context is set to local compute context, because we're not actually using Spark for this portion. We're going to load the um, logistic regression model that we formerly um, saved on disk. And we're going to reference the, the test data that we also saved on disk. And we're going to take the first six rows of that test data just to get the column information. We'll call that create column info function um, to get those factor levels. And then we will define what we call the model info, which is both the, a list containing both the logistic regression model and the column information. And then we're going to define our scoring function, which is the function we'll use to 
um, respond to any requests on this web service. And the scoring function, uh, we'll call the arcs predict function to do the scoring, as we saw in the previous script. So now we're going to authenticate with the operationalization service. That involves loading the MRS deploy package. And then you're going to have to enter a password here. Um, so everyone will be using the same username, admin. You're all on separate servers, so you're not interfering with each other. But you, where it says like insert password here, you need to replace that. And I'll zoom in a little so everyone can see it clearly. You need to replace the insert password here on line 43 with KDD 2017, and then the plus symbol, and then Halifax in lowercase. Once you've defined that password, you can call the remote login function. And uh, let me zoom out now. Oh, I didn't actually run those lines. I just showed them to you. OK. So now I call the remote login function. And uh, it won't say anything. It, it, it would complain if it couldn't log in. But uh, if you don't see any complaint, then you're logged in. And now you can deploy this scoring function as a web service. So this, we're, we're deploying it currently to the same machine we're on. We use the local host uh, IP address there. But we could be deploying it to a separate oper operationalization server. So let's do the deployment. Uh, we can specify a version for this API. If you run it twice with the same version number, it's going to complain that you've already deployed a function with that version number. So now I call the publish service function to deploy this logistic regression model. That seemed to work fine. Now I will try to consume that web service. As I said, I can consume web services from like 30 different languages, but we provide an easy way to do that from R. We just call get service to get the HTTPS endpoint. Then we call the scoring function of that web service endpoint. That'll result in a response. We get the output from that response, which is scores. And then if we print out those scores, we will see we have the predictions of, of delay. So I hope you were able to follow that. Um, we're now going to wrap up my portion. Um, I'm, going, I'm running a little out of time, so I'm going to go quickly through those comparisons I alluded to earlier. Um, we have a slide here. The slides are on the GitHub. This comparison slide shows different platforms that the different libraries I talked about can run on, ranging from single nodes alone to single and distributed nodes with Spark, with MapReduce, and with SQL Server and Teradata, depending on the library. And when we did some comparisons, uh, let me make this as large as possible. When we did our comparisons um, across these various libraries, we found that our server for logistic regression for the test that we ran on was uh, very scalable and fast. It was, in fact, the fastest um, among the ones that could reach a billion rows. And um, we're not too biased, though, because Spark R admittedly was faster in loading the data. Um, Although H2O has very fast ways to load the data as well if you're loading directly from a file rather than from a Spark data frame. So let's keep that in mind. When we come to the step of fitting the model, our server turned out the fastest of the ones that scaled to a billion rows. And also, in terms of making predictions, our server was also fastest for a billion rows. So we see that each library has its, its a range of rows and, and its types of problems that it excels at. Well, I'm, I'm plot says million. It goes up to 1,000 million. So that's a billion rows. Oh, OK. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's Qu no scale on the left-hand side. Right. Those are just relative time. So we're not printing the actual time, because that will depend on the number of nodes you have and the speed of those nodes. But um, we wanted to point out the relative time. But is it a logarithmic scale? Oh, it's a linear scale. Linear, okay. It is a linear scale, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I'm going to turn it over to Bob, Robert Horton. Um, the coffee will be out at 3.30. Oh. I like Bob. We can have an early coffee break, it sounds like. So how long do we want to break for? Like um, 20 minutes? Is 20 minutes good for everyone? Um, OK, so we will be back. It's 3.11, so we'll be at 3.30. 
you'll get a little jump on the coffee break. And the snacks. And the snacks. Thank you.